All right. Hello, everybody, and welcome back to the MetaMoon podcast. This is our first episode of 2020, and I'm so excited to be here with Christina LaCary, who is a personal evolution coach who helps you transform your relationship by evolving and healing. Did I get all that yep. right? Does that sound right? <laughs> okay, perfect. And I found her through Instagram, actually, in the comment section of Holistic Psychologist's oh Instagram. My God. <laughs> and yeah, we kind of like got talking and then DMing and just like immediately realized that we have a lot in common with what we're trying to do and what we are interested in talking about. So I thought she'd be a really good guest. So welcome. Thank you. And we're going to try a new format today of this game that I have. I have some cards here with some questions and it's super simple, not confusing. Christina is going to roll the dice and the number she rolls is going to correspond to different categories of cards, which all have questions and it's going to be super fun. We'll see how it goes. And before we get into that though, I want to have you first tell us all just a little bit about your story and who you are. I like to tell people to do this as like a childhood fairy tale if you were going to give us like the fairy tale <laughs> version of the story of you and how you ended up here mm. like how you would tell it like that <sighs> well I don't know that it's a fairy tale per se um, <laughs> it can be a dark one yeah I think I got here from being in a lot of pain mm -hmm. <laughs> most of my life and really becoming curious about the shared energetics of my experiences and what the similarities were and how I was showing up and participating. Mm. So something that was really powerful for me that really helped me to get into this work was realizing that the past X amount of relationships, if you could even call them that, they were not relationships, mm. were with drug addicts who were still in love with their ex-girlfriend who looked just like me. Oh, so okay. I kind of started to study things like how am I participating? How am I behaving what's my emotional blueprint and really wanting to become more present to dissolve a lot of the patterns that created my personality mm -hmm. oh, okay cool so that <laughs> got you into doing the how did that transition into the coaching you kind of learned that through your process yourself and then thought so that happened and mm -hmm. then I thought I had done a lot of work and I was a lot more conscious than I really was. And then two years ago, I entered a relationship with my best friend of 10 years mm -hmm. and I quickly realized that I had a lot more work to do and he reflected yeah. that back to me. So I had a really hard time putting the things that I knew into practice. Mm -hmm. And so I created a lot of the tools now that I use in my coaching and my courses for mm -hmm. myself and mm -hmm. then naturally it just sort of evolved into a business. That's awesome. Yeah. That's a good way for it to happen, like for things to just be like, I'm doing this already and I like it and now I can make it part of what I'm here to do. Yeah. That's awesome. Well, I'm so excited because from what I've seen of your Instagram and the different things you share, there's so much knowledge there for individual healing, but also for relationships with is something that I feel like we all need to learn more of, of how do we like not only become healthier people in ourselves, but when we're choosing to be in partnership with somebody or in relationship with somebody, that's naturally going to bring up so much. And oh, yeah. so how do we navigate that? <laughs> and I think a lot of times I've even thought like, if stuff is coming up, this is bad. Like this is scary, but sometimes there's like, it's good for things to come up if you know how to work through it in a good way. Cause we all have stuff and yeah. relationships are going to bring that out for sure. <laughs> so cool. Well, Let's dive into this then. So they give you this lucky dice. All right. Let's see where we start. One. One. That's a great place to start. Okay. <laughs> so this is the personal question pile. So what are your daily practices? God, you know, I wish I had some. <laughs> um, <laughs> I really believe in simplifying. And I think yeah. for a long time, I was very into like the journaling and the affirmations and all of the processes. Um, and then just through my own experience of really wanting to be free, I sort of naturally stopped doing all of that. Yeah. I stopped trying to create things and control life and manipulate it. And instead of thinking, what do I want? I just became present and let life flow. And I've always been really good at manifesting in that sense where things just kind of like flow and fall out of the sky and not mm -hmm. always, obviously. And that's not what life is about, but I realized that I was putting so much attention and energy into trying to receive things that I wasn't mm -hmm. fully giving and flowing my own energy. So the only daily practice I really have is breathing and flooding my energy in my body. Uh -huh. um, 
and I don't really call them practices in that way where I do them ritually, but yeah. that's like my sacred connection to my being. Yeah. So you just do it more kind of when you feel like you need that. Or when the, I like, remember moment, too, or? like I, my mind is pretty much almost always quiet now. I've mm-hmm. worked a long time on that, but I do it if it does get noisy or if I feel like there's something stagnant in my body or something that's kind of just hanging out there mm-hmm. or like, yeah, if I'm making a cup of tea and I feel I'm not breathing, like, okay, back into the body. Yeah. So it's sort of, yeah, on an ad, on need basis. Yeah. It's interesting. I feel like there is a, something I've noticed in my own journey where there's seasons where I feel like I really need kind of the discipline of a practice. And then there's other times where it's like, this is actually getting in the way for Mm, me now, or it's become about this thing. And I've had some other friends that I've talked to about this too, where they feel the same, where on the, the journey towards healing, there's, it can become a lot too much about practices. And then now you're like, that becomes the space of overwhelm and perfection. And for me, a lot of my journey has been noticing that I, I can be really obsessed with self perfection or doing all these things and taking all the boxes. And so throwing out all the practices sometimes is better for us so we can actually be in the moment and seeing what's happening. So definitely. I love that. That's awesome. Okay, cool. Shall we roll it again? Yeah. See you next. Bye. I had to count. I was like, what number Okay, is that? this is the game of firsts. So this game, I have a bunch of cards that have different life moments that will have happened a first time at different ages. So you're going to tell me the age that this first thing happened. And if you want to tell something about it, you <laughs> okay. can tell us that too. So it'll be just kind of rapid fire through this. So first car. Uh, 18. 18. <laughs> so you, they made you wait a little bit. They did. Yep. Cell phone. 13 13 I did a little powerpoint on why I should get one and my dad as soon as he saw the one about like driving with older hot boys he was like buy her that cell phone oh my gosh I, my parents didn't let me get one until I was like I shared a cell phone with my dad no, until I was 18 <laughs> and so I had to tell people like don't text me now my dad has his phone back oh my god it was god. very weird that would have never worked with my high school experience <laughs> never I would have been murdered by my dad yeah there was some awkward <laughs> moments for sure first crush do you remember oh do i remember yep um clayton dawson third grade we had like little secret senders i don't even know what they were they were like instant messengers for little kids and my friend and i i was like i have a crush on clayton and she told everybody and oh he was gosh. like i do not have a crush on you back oh that's so sad so many wounds came from that always there's always wounds around those yeah. crushes and those first little moments <laughs> of affection uh, first time getting drunk. Uh, 13. 13. Oh my gosh. Yeah. That's, I grew up in a wild up, town. It was like gossip time. girl. Yeah. It's a small <laughs> town thing. It's like, there's nothing better to do. No. <laughs> first, I love you. Like romantic. I love like you. Like a real, I love you. Or like it just, you say it cause you say it. Like, like just a, I love you that felt. Yeah. Whatever comes to your mind is the okay, first my partner that. now, um, two years ago, he was, he's my first real relationship. Oh, okay. Yeah. That's awesome. So, yeah. Okay. We'll talk more about that. <laughs> uh, first job. Uh, I don't know. Something silly like a dentist's office clerk or something. A dentist's office I don't know. Clerk. My friend's mom used to work at one, so I probably did it for like $8 an hour to buy like yeah. Abercrombie jeans or something. Yeah. I mean, some places $8 <laughs> an hour. Like, I remember the first time that I got a raise to $9 an hour, and I thought I was living large. I was making more money than all my friends, and now I'm like, oh my God, I would have died. Uh, first time abroad? Um, When I was, however old I was, 18, I guess, I went to Greece, France, and Germany for my high school graduation present. That's good. Yeah. But did, was it like eye-opening to the world at that point 18 totally and I I was really like small-minded and spoiled then so when my mom told me that was my gift I was like what no I want to party with all my friends and then I got there and I was like oh wow yeah Yeah. so definitely eye-opening for sure (laughs) first kiss Ooh, kindergarten kindergarten some some guy not guy some little kid came up to me (laughs) we're like taking our school picture and he just kissed me didn't give him didn't tell him to he just did it on the lips and I remember I was so pissed I was like you cannot just kiss me and then they like took the picture against the wall so whenever I see that picture I'm like I remember somebody stole my (laughs) right before that photo where I was like oh no yeah so sad first relationship you said I think you just said so I had one in high school and 
I don't really consider it like a real relationship. Mm-hmm. It just, you know, it was like a high school one that you date for like six months and don't know each other. You mm-hmm. don't even know yourself then. So to really call that a relationship, I feel like is a disservice to actual relationships. Yeah. So, and I've dated people loosely, but this relationship is the first one where it's like, you're my person. Let's do everything together. Yeah. We love and care about each other. Yeah. So that's good. Like yeah. a real partnership. Yes. Uh, first breakup. I guess then it would have yeah. been following up on that. <laughs> high school. But it would have been the high school one. Yeah. He got me a stuffed animal from um, CVS for Valentine's Day. And then me and my dad like put it in the car window and rolled the window up. So it's like head was in there and it just like fluttered away into the highway. Oh my gosh. <laughs> That's amazing. <laughs> what a good dad move. So aggressive. All right. Shall we roll again? Yeah. Let's see what we get next. Oh shit. Oh and it's down and it's a I three. dropped it on the floor. All right, this is the other game. This is the game of facts. So, thank you, mystery being (laughs) from afar. All right, so this is the game of facts. So I'm going to give you a topic, and you're going to give me just, like, the first fact that comes to your mind about the topic. You ready? Okay. Okay, the first one is attraction. Not everything. Mm. (laughs) Yes, that's good. (laughs) Emotions. Not who you are. Mm Mm-hmm. Pain. Not real. <laughs> I like the way this is going. <laughs> Energy. What everything is. <laughs> Trauma. Lives in the body. Mm-hmm. Triggers. Can be managed. Body. Hmm. <laughs> A beautiful vessel for this earthly experience. Mm. I love that. Sex. Something I should probably have more of, <laughs> but I'm not. <laughs> I am. I love it, but it's like going to the gym for me where it's like, so you have to like make me do it. And then when yeah. I get there, I'm like, let's do this every day. I love it. And then it's like, come on, come on. You haven't done it. And I'm like, oh shit. Sorry. I've been busy. Yeah. It's funny. <laughs> Cause I feel like a lot of women in particular feel that way, but we're, we all feel like we're supposed to not because of the way that cultural narratives are like you just need to be this sexual being that wants this all the time but at the same time culture has like traumatized a lot of us and abuse like there's just so many other things at play and I I feel like biologically that seems to be the lot the case for a lot of women in particular that I talk to where it's like once it's happening I'm like this is great but (laughs) it's not like yeah yeah it's just varied it's like sex is so varied for people like and we have such a narrow view of how we think it's supposed to go but totally like a lot of things way. yeah that's so true cool i liked that i liked the way that you did that that was awesome <laughs> all right there you go six. six is story okay so you're gonna tell me a story about whatever this card says okay breakthrough Ooh. okay um I'd say 2015, I was in New Mexico working on a TV pilot, and it was when I really started to practice mindfulness in a very deep and true way. Uh So I was getting up every morning at like five o'clock, just intending to be in complete silence. And it was the first time I ever really experienced a gap between my thoughts. And I started crying because my mind was so intensely overactive where I thought, maybe I should go to a mental hospital or I need like a drug. Like it was just insanely loud and the thoughts it was being were really like traumatic and tormenting Mm -hmm. and so in being able to experience that even though it was just a couple seconds it changed my whole freaking life because I was like whoa imagine how good I would feel not if I had this this or that but if I could just live in this space of stillness yeah and it really set me on my journey to being more mindful and meditating and being more present because I knew it was actually possible and you were working on a TV pilot. What were you, what were you doing on the pilot? I was working as a production secretary. Oh, okay, cool. Yeah. And what so what was it that caused that gap in your thoughts? I think looking for it. I yeah. think, you know, I spent a lot of time researching about the mind and quotes and mindfulness and all of that stuff. And I didn't know what any of the things meant. Mm-hmm. I was just reading and wanting to know. And so when I experienced it, I was sort of like, this is what they're talking about. Yeah. Um, I think it's called, oh God, I'm going to butcher it. I feel like it's called Satori or something. That's yeah. like a, yeah, it mm-hmm. is. Nice. 
Mm -hmm. Um, So I knew just from like the knowledge and the information that it was a thing. And so that if I didn't know, I don't think it would have been as powerful. Mm. So it really helped me to look for it and then looking for it helped it to expand. Yeah, that's interesting that it was reading about it that kind of led you to becoming at least aware of this is what's happening once it happened to you. Mm -hmm. Because I've I've wrestled a lot with the role that knowledge and information plays in our experience because you can't learn yourself into those spaces necessarily yeah, without like, like the experience <laughs> that you can like ha- know all the information. I know so many people who know all the information, they can talk all the talk, but without learning how to embody that into your lived experience, it's not going to do anything for you, but it does, it can make it that much easier when you are in that experience to be able to put a word to like, Oh, this is like what's happening. Like I can name what's happening and that does help. I've as a writer and somebody who uses words, I've had to wrestle with that. Cause I'm like, I'm never going to help anybody like just by giving them information, but it can help. Cause in those moments where I've experienced it, all of that stuff that I've read comes back of like, this is what everybody was talking about. But if someone hasn't experienced those moments, those words fall on deaf ears to a certain extent because it's like I'm describing, you know, some other planet that I've been to (laughs) to somebody who's never been to that planet at a certain point. You're like, cool, that's cool. I don't really know what you're saying. But if that person then goes to that planet, they're going to be like, I'm so glad I learned about it before I got here. So I think it takes a a lot of commitment and a desire to want to experience it, though. Like, yeah, I read The Power of Now. Mm hmm probably 10 times before I really started to live it. Yeah. The first time I read it, I was 21 and I was like, cool. Yeah. Being present's awesome. I'm going to go back to my life of never fucking being present ever and <laughs> yeah. just like quote it on my Facebook. Yeah. And it wasn't because I was a shitty person. I just didn't understand. But there was something throughout my life every time that always drew me back to those teachings. And so I think it's just like a deepening of a commitment and a practice mm-hmm. if you are curious where No, the knowledge itself is just pointing to these practices, but it is really helpful if you don't know anything about it to kind of like encourage you. Yeah. And like initiate, I mean, Eckhart Tolle even says in that book, like a lot of people are going to read this and it's not going to make sense to them unless you're ready. Same thing with new earth. So it's like, it can help you get, it's, it's a tool on the journey for sure, but not the whole thing. Mm -hmm. It's great. All right. Yours again. Oh, six again. Another story. All right. Let's see. Failure. <laughs> Failure. Ooh. Hmm. It's hard to say like one specific thing because I feel like there have been so many failures in my <laughs> yeah. mind's eye of what um, hasn't been or hasn't arrived yet. I guess I would say just like any sort of thing that I've ever thought I needed to have to achieve that has fell or that has fallen through and that I have realized like ultimately that it's not for me and that's okay. And that's Mm -hmm. sort of how I embody things. Like even now I have so many people who are like, I want to do this work. I want to do this. And then they just fade away. Yeah. And instead of chasing them, I'm like, okay. So I really learned through all of these things that I've tried to gain or receive or control or experience when they don't work out to kind of sit still within myself Mm -hmm. it's not like one particular experience that comes to mind but sort of like a way of being that's come from things I want not happening and being okay that they didn't yeah yeah that's good like making peace with with failure being a natural part of yeah. life that's not necessarily a negative yeah it's not thing. personal yeah oh god if it, if i made these things personal i'd never get out of bed it's yeah you know people have all these ideas like oh if this client says no it's your energy you're doing something wrong mm. i'm like what i'm supposed to get 500 clients a day like because yeah. my energy is aligned like i do believe energy is a big part of things yeah but just because you have your energy aligned doesn't mean everything's going to work out in your favor every second of the day and that's mm-hmm. not the reality of this universe and it's beautiful <laughs> yeah because you're in a sense it, aligning your energy with like where the universe is moving so yeah. I've found in that process it's less of like I have my egoic idea of what I'm trying to force to happen and if I align my energy to my opinion yes then it'll happen and it's less like that and more of like as I align my energy with what's happening yes. and accepting it then my attachment to whatever I wanted kind of melts anyway. And then things flow in and out and you're not, you don't have such like a rigid grip on them anymore. Yeah. 
I for agree. Sure. That's good. Right. <laughs> what do we got next? Three. Three. That one we already oh. finished, so we'll <laughs> skip it. Four. Four. Good. I like these ones. Okay, this is on your expertise. So these are like relationship questions and like healing questions. So the, f- the first one. How can we know the difference between needing to accept an issue versus working through it versus ending the relationship? This is exactly what my partner and I are going through now. <laughs> Um, it's a hard one. Yeah, we like broke up two times the other day over exactly oh, wow. this and then had a major breakthrough around it. Um, so this is a perfect question. Awesome. And I don't have any qualms about being honest in my relationship because it's not fucking perfect. It's not supposed to be. And yeah. I think people have all these illusions. And it's like, no, we're human. We get triggered. Shit comes up. We get frustrated. I think it's everything I do is really from my body. So I Mm -hmm. like to feel into things. So I think that, you know, being able to share something with your partner about something you notice, something that's affecting the relationship is beautiful, but also to expect them not to change. And if you're okay with that, realizing that it's more about your own level of consciousness that's important to you. Yeah. So if my partner were to never change, would I still be with him? Yes. And so people come to me all the time and they're like, he's a lot different than me he's at a different space than than I am but if you're willing to accept that then really what's bothering you is your lack of consciousness around his unconsciousness Mm -hmm. so I always feel like it's smart and best to do the work within yourself like if I grow and evolve and heal I'll be more neutral I'll be more open I'll be more loving but that being said you know the goal isn't to just accept everything and kind of be a doormat in that space. Like you want to have a partner who's willing to do the work and meet you. Yeah. That's a hundred percent true, but you can't control and manipulate them and their timeline and their growth. And as mm-hmm. someone who it's taken me a long ass time to get here, I know that. Yeah. Um, but in terms of ending a relationship, I feel like it's, how does it feel to you and your body? Like, Mm. Are you both trying? Are you honestly being as neutral and open and loving and compassionate as you can be? Is this person trying? Are you guys still willing to do the work? Because I think a relationship is sort of like at the end of the rope when both people are like, I don't want to try anymore. Yeah. Yeah, I like that because it makes it a lot more about the moment and like your dynamic than it is about like, well, this is the moment for everybody that you should stop. Like it's more... checking in with yourself and what's happening and it's more about the effort being put in than the results that are coming from it or like what's happening so you can be patient with the the pace of the growth and everything but also there is a balance there of like knowing how to like know when you need to do something for your own health or remove yourself from somebody if something becomes so toxic like it's difficult especially for women I've saw I've watched the pendulum just swing from like we're all just these little housewives and that's what a wife is supposed to be to now there's this like feminist revolution. (laughs) But then I see this also like, no canceled, canceled out, out like boundary, boundary. And sometimes I'm like, where is the grace? Like, where is the room to work on things like there? And so there's a balance there. I feel of knowing how to have compassion and allow space for people to be imperfect because the Prince Charming (laughs) he ain't out there I hate to break it to you ladies but (laughs) it's I mean I won't lie and say it's easy it's hard especially in the line of work that I do you know I have my own unconscious like rigidity and standards for my partner as well where I'm Mm -hmm. like okay I told you this six months ago why haven't you evolved through this yeah and he likes to remind me that it took me a solid year before I could even begin to like inhabit my body and take over my triggers it was Mm. really 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 tough for me Like I was so sensitive, so angry, so offended by everything that he was like, I don't even know you. Mm. So I have to really look in perspective. Like I've been there. I get it. I know how hard it is and focus on the moments where I do see him trying. And even if it's like one in 10, it's just, it's a whole lifetime of unlearning, you know? And so Mm. it really is a balance for what feels good for you. But I think it's so important to honor the shared humanity because so many people are in this illusion of like, I deserve better. I want something more. And it's like, but who are you being in that dynamic? Because if you're not willing to look at yourself and your own participation, you're going to leave that relationship, have the same exact experience and never grow within yourself or Mm -hmm. within your partnership. Yeah. What do you think is the best way to 
to support your partner in that growth process without just being like, all right, well, you need to do this and like clock's ticking. (laughs) Like how do we actually help them without having expectations but support them in that process? I think the more present you can be in witnessing their delusions and their patterns and their reactions and seeing it from like a zoomed out space and understand that they're the same delusions and patterns that take you over. Mm -hmm. It's kind of like, I really can't be upset or expect you to grow any faster than you can because everybody has their own level of consciousness. And, Mm -hmm. you know, my partner hasn't been studying this stuff and living it the way that I have for years. He talks about it with me, but I don't think he has the same understanding. He definitely hasn't had that space between his thoughts and that moment that, yeah. you know, so it's like you have to realize a very small percentage of the world is doing this work and to mm-hmm. show up acting like they are is just ludicrous. Yeah. <laughs> and not everybody's there in the same moment too. We were literally just joking with some friends, some couple friends we were hanging out with the other night of how like we all admitted that we've had moments and arguments where one of the people in the argument will like kind of zoom out and be like, this is all like <laughs> illusions, but then the other person is so in it. They're like, stop, don't tell me that. Like, cause it feels, that feels very dismissive, even though it's true. But yeah. like in certain moments, like you can't just tell somebody everything you're feeling right now isn't real. <laughs> like it's not always helpful. I know. I know. So it's kind of funny to know. Yeah. Like how much to kind of jump into the game, so to speak, and like deal with these, these triggers and these feelings that feel so like, important in the moment I think a lot of that comes up too and trying to hold space yeah like my partner was just going through a really difficult time for the past like year and I really not to be a master at all got to be so much better because especially because of the work that I do my intention is like let me help you see this clearly let me give you some tools let me help shift some energy and he's like Mm -hmm. I don't want that I want to express myself I know that it's an illusion I know that it's not real but let me have it Mm -hmm. and so I really had to get good at being in my body and being a container for my emotions and sitting there and not just being silent but saying things that were supportive without allowing the delusion to continue without yeah. denying it so mm. really things that were just neutral like I hear you that must be yeah. really challenging for you what does mm. that feel like in a way that didn't sound like a bullshit therapist just kind of feeding you generic questions yeah you know? <laughs> yeah <gasps> it's it's tough um okay let's do another roll this is fun one personal all right can you pinpoint a moment where you had a major shift in your consciousness yes um when my mom died Mm. she and I had a really really tumultuous relationship and I think my whole life I thought she was evil and I didn't realize she was mentally ill and um she died very suddenly And it was actually fucking crazy. I was going out of town and a woman who I had never met before came up to me and said, are you going out of town? You should stay. Your mom's going to die. Whoa. What? Yeah. Just a random stranger told you that. She happened to be a psychic. And so I stayed and she did die. And there was a feeling where you thought this might be true. Yeah. She was in the hospital. She was in the hospital. But she was just like going in for like a surgery. Uh Uh-huh. Um, And so I was like, what the hell? So anyway, so yeah, that day I felt like so much of my egoic identity shattered because I was sitting there. She's literally on her deathbed and I was just crying and I was realizing like, none of this matters. I'm so Mm -hmm. sorry. Can you forgive me? I forgive you. Like what was anything even over? What, what did it all mean that it was so important that it came to this place where now you're literally watching somebody die and it all really dissolves. So yeah. after that, I feel, you know, there was definitely a big shift. I wouldn't say that it was like my brain shut off and I quickly evolved in that moment. But that was huge for me where I started realizing like living that I could die at any moment and not just knowing it. Yeah. Death does that. Like loss does that. And it's funny because pe- there's so many people that are like, oh, I want to experience more awareness. I want to have a shift in consciousness. And it's like. It's not the news everybody wants to hear, but that comes when you're at the lowest of lows, when things get stripped away from you unexpectedly. Like those are the moments where we have those, those shifts in awareness because we realize, whoa, like it just puts everything into perspective and the temporary nature of this life is exactly what makes it so rich when you're, when you live in that, that Mm -hmm. this moment, everything that's here is not promised and everything that I get caught up in my mind is 
not necessary so just like show (laughs) up and be here and it's those are the moments where that happens yeah (laughs) yeah that's intense all right one again all right what was the last time you or when i guess when is this is a mistake on my writing here (laughs) when was the last time you cried and why um oh my god today i cried today yeah um because i was actually just thinking of eckhart tolle and i love his work so much and Mm -hmm. i just started to listen to the power of now on audiobook again (laughs) like i can't even tell you how many times i've read it but every time i listen to it or read it it goes so much deeper and there was something he said that i mean all of his words are so fucking powerful to me they just cut through Mm -hmm. um damn it, I've been saying it or like thinking about it all day and now I'm going to butcher it. But it says, um, the fearful, shit, what is it? The (laughs) fearful, oh my God. If you paraphrase. Something about like the fearful mind is, is, or the fear is basically a narrative of the mind. Uh And um, it just really got to me because we forget, like we think that we're afraid of all of these things happening and we're afraid that we're not going to get what we want or what we want is going to be taken away, like we're just saying. But we're not, we're just attached to the mind and that's the mind's nature to have those fear-based thoughts that are in the future. And so, I don't know, it was just so simple that hearing it, it just like, I was just like, oh my God, it's so true. And it really catapulted me into this really intense silence for the past like 24 hours where I spend a lot of time in this space, but when I get busy, I'm not always completely present. And so that sort of, to me, was just like, this is all you have. Everything else is fake. Don't get it twisted. Yeah. And I was just sort of weeping because it's so beautiful, but also his work so powerful and it's changed my whole life. So I'm yeah. just really grateful for Are him. you a frequent quiet crier? Choir. <laughs> Are you a frequent crier? Um, Why is that so-, so hard to say? Are you a frequent crier? <laughs> Are you a frequent crier? Um, yes and no. I like cry at little beautiful things like this yeah. girl at Whole Foods yesterday. Oh, I guess I kind of cried yesterday, but not like a full cry. <laughs> You're like, nah, it's yesterday and today, <laughs> today and the day and before. Day. And- there was a dog and it was thirsty and she like took her water and she was like four and she like went and put it over next right. to him. And I was like, this is so nice of you. I wish all of humanity was so nice. Yeah. She was like, who is this lady? <laughs> <laughs> I find that like I'd never used to cry. And then the more I've kind of opened myself up and Mm. done a lot of work to try to live very open-heartedly and very in the moment I just cry all the time I like love it it's like my body's just like yes Mm. release all these yeah it feels good it's like honoring life and the temporary aspect of it Mm -hmm. for sure right five we're done with five five is null three we're done with three (laughs) three is null Four. That's another <laughs> expert question. All right. This game is amazing. Oh, thanks. Kudos it's to you. Fun. I'm excited. This is like the the trial run. You're my guinea pig. I love so it. It's fun. All right. Once we have developed awareness of a pattern, how do we do the work of clearing and rewriting it? I'm excited to hear what you say about this because this is what <gasps> we talked about yes, on Instagram. Yes. Yes. Um, for me, it's really about being in the body. Like that's mm-hmm. pretty much my answer for everything. Whenever my clients ask me something, I'm like, sorry, it's just the same answer. Yeah. Be in the body and then whatever. Yeah. So like for me, triggers were so freaking hard. I, oh my God, I yelled at my boyfriend because he didn't know how to cut an avocado and it was <laughs> slowing me down in the kitchen and messing up my schedule. This was like two years ago, but <laughs> that's how serious I was about yeah. everything. And so it took me a long time to make any shift. So personally, like for me, for triggers as an example, I really had to learn how to be in my body to feel the different sensations as they were arising. So I could be in that space to consciously decide to be something else instead of letting it take me over. Mm -hmm. And that's not to say that it was easy. It took a long time. And in the beginning, the victory was not overcoming the trigger. It was in realizing that I lost consciousness, even if it was 20 minutes after it happened. So it's really about like determination, patience, and persistence within yourself. Mm -hmm. But I think I am not really about 
building mental structures I'm like I want to build burn the whole fucking thing down so yeah. like I'm not ever gonna say go in and think positive thoughts on top of it because mm. I never felt like that actually changed anything in my reality yeah in the sense of how I showed up to the world it may have made me feel better temporarily but mm-hmm. like the energetic structures were still there well so, you're you're still playing the mind game yeah it's just like exactly a different move in yes, the mind game. yes so being in the body, I think, and having that awareness for what's shifting and changing, sort of like if the body is your house and then it's like somebody turned on the air conditioning. So like, oh, there's something in my arm. Okay, I'm getting angry right now. And like instead of projecting it onto my partner, taking a minute to breathe, focus on that energy, releasing it, and kind of like creating your own process from there. Yeah. Wow. That's great. So breathing definitely is a way to get into our bodies. Do you have any other like... I really like what I call flooding my energy. So I start mm-hmm. like at my feet where I'll focus the energy in my feet. And then once I start to feel a sensation, if it's like a tingling or a vibrating, then I move up to my calves and my knees and I do the whole body when I get to my head and then I recycle a few times. Mm-hmm. So that's really good for like being mindful of your state, clearing your energy, mm-hmm. mastering your emotions. So it's really kind of like a, a hybrid tool. Mm. So that would be good too. I think I've heard you say that for like, noticing if you've kind of picked up something energetically oh, yeah. that isn't yours yes. that practice can help you kind of get rid of that stuff <laughs> for sure I mean when my partner was going through this thing for the past year like I would just lay next to him sometimes and I'd be like oh I feel it I have to release it yeah and he'd be like why are you coughing why are you hiccuping what's going on I'm like <laughs> nothing is just your energy <laughs> yeah and he's like uh-huh okay <laughs> maybe yes. you're just hiccuping I'm like no you don't get it it's in my arm I feel it yeah that's real so thing. real. I mean, it's a, it sounds like woo woo at first, but it's so real. Like I've really had to notice that I am such an energetic sponge and figure out how to do that. Cause I'll walk by someone and I'm like, mm-hmm. ah, I'll, like I just sponge everything. Yeah. That's intense. how I feel when I go into target. Yeah. <laughs> I have to, I'm like, I will be in there for three minutes and three minutes only. Yeah. It's yes. <laughs> it's so All right. Four again. It's good because I like these ones. This is my favorite. <laughs> okay. This you kind of touched on this, but can you talk us through what to do when we get triggered? <laughs> yeah. So I would say that it kind of starts before the actual trigger. So like I would practice spending time breathing and being in your body. And if Mm. focusing on your internal energy and flooding your energy is like too much for you and it's too advanced, then I'd focus on like physical senses. So Mm. in the beginning when I wasn't able to access that part of myself, I would really breathe. And because your brain can only focus on two things at a time, I'd be like, I'm going to touch this couch and breathe, or I'm going to smell or listen for a bird chirping to Mm. really keep me in my body and out of my head. So whatever's helpful for you, wherever you're at and being able to stay in your body Mm -hmm. and then being able to feel like what's going on and not necessarily emotions because those are just like mind made sensations, but okay, there's like a heat or like right now I have a cramp here or like there's a vibrating or an itch. So getting to know what's happening in your body so that when the energy starts to shift, you know that you're getting triggered. And Mm -hmm. in the beginning, just even knowing it, is more important than being able to overcome it because it's a really hard process. Yeah. It takes a lot of time. So I would say creating that awareness around your internal space and being in reality is the most important thing so that you can notice that shift in energy, the shift in emotion, the shift Mm -hmm. in the sensation, and then creating and cultivating that practice to bring awareness as you experience it before it becomes you. Mm, Yeah, senses, that's very Eckhart Tolle of you. (laughs) Like, just look at the tree. That's why Eckhart Tolle was, just look at the tree. <laughs> I love See his little how voice. It just is it's in being. the moment. <laughs> yeah, that's good. All right. Thank you. Two. Existential. We haven't done one of these yet. Oh. These are really deep existential questions of life. Oh, my God. I love this. Why is there suffering? <sighs> because. Um, I know. <laughs> Because we live in our minds. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Agreed. Um, yeah, I mean, I think that there is a, there is a difference between pain and suffering, where pain yes. is a sensation that you experience, and suffering is the sort of like recycling of that experience in your mind that allows trauma to exist in the body. Mm-hmm. So I noticed that it's so easy to create suffering when you're resisting and labeling reality, 
And it doesn't need to be something really traumatic. It's just anything that you resist and carry. So I think personally, the way that I try to transmute it is just by being more present in my body to witness, you know, if I've started to go along with the thought, oh, how interesting I'm telling this story and I'm letting it take over my energy. Yeah. Yeah, that's so true. Pain versus suffering. That's been like a just game changing distinction for me in my life of like, I think for a long time I thought they were the same thing and I wanted to stop all pain. I thought that's what enlightenment was, was like, Mm. I'll never experience pain. And I was like, nah, that's pain is life. But you you don't have to suffer through it. Like you can experience it and see that it's beautiful and a teacher and like is a signal. Even the moments where I'm even suffering, I sometimes now see is like, this is a useful tool. That's, it's like the alert system of my body saying, Hey, you're caught up in some shit Wake right up. now. Yeah, 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 so yeah. Even then I'm like, oh, thank you, suffering, for telling me that I'm totally lost. You're so graceful. <laughs> yes. Right, Two more existential questions. Nice. That's a good one. Is this real? This? This. 100% no. I've seen some shit. No, it's not. <laughs> what scene would it elaborate? Oh, God, I'm going to go there. <laughs> Let's um, go there. Do you know what an orb is? Yes. I I've am an orbs. orb and I've you- seen an orb. It was crazy. I had like, when I was in college, all this crazy ass shit happened to me. Uh-huh. I was like seeing things and I had shared dreams with people and I had out of body experiences that were like inception, like dream within a dream within a dream and then waking up in reality and people mirroring the things back that I was like, I'm going crazy. I don't know what's real anymore. And it was really beautiful. My energy healer, he's the craziest person in the world he's the best (laughs) he told me that there were like beings on the other side that were trying to wake me up to the fact that this reality isn't real and I was terrified I was like 21 I was like I just want to get drunk and have sex I don't want to see things I don't want to walk through walls um so I know yeah there's this is not it I don't know what else there is and I don't know any of the questions or the answers but it it definitely hard to live that way though it feels really real you know Mm -hmm. so real but I try to remember and remind myself when I get caught up in things and I'm like you're gonna wake up one day and be like why did I take this so serious yeah well that's a that's a tough balance of figuring out what to do with that psychologically because I definitely went off the deep end of like we're in the matrix and this is all an illusion (laughs) and that can really quickly like derail you into a really unhealthy way to exist (laughs) and then it became all escapism and I was like obsessed with being like abducted by aliens who would then take me to the real place and I just wanted to get out of here like I waking up to me became about leaving this and then that really changed for me at one point where I realized it's not about like this whatever we want to call it can radically change in the moment when you're seeing it as what it truly is and the illusion part of it is all what we make in our mind and so that really shifted for me at some point because for a while I was like I gotta get out of the matrix like what how do I get out of here yeah I had um I had an experience in college that really shook me where I felt like my life wasn't real yeah and it was crazy because everything that would happen, I'd feel like I was just waiting to find out that it wasn't real. Like my dad would call and I'd be like, he's not real. Why is he calling me and asking if I want to have dinner? (laughs) This is the only moment that exists. I'm never going to see him. Like it was like a trip for me because I believed it so deeply and because I experienced all those things that I could Mm -hmm. never explain or justify that I started to look at this world as sort of like what, why, uh, like I just felt so confused about it all. But yeah, there's like a particular type of Buddhism. I'm, I can't remember which tradition it is in Buddhism that says that it's not real, but the way to live is that as if it is, but as if this moment is real, not the past or the future right. that like now is real because otherwise you can get super caught up in like, oh, this isn't real. So it doesn't matter what I do. But if we're longing to be compassionate, present people, then you have to kind of accept, okay, now is real. Me sitting here talking to you in our experience, you know, if, yeah. if I'm really in the moment, then that is. Because real is a relative word in the first place. It's like, oh, my brain's hurting right now. Not like, real? Yeah, we yeah. know. The existential <laughs> questions take us down the tunnel. <laughs> and here we are. But yeah, so yes. Oh, 
I love these questions. <laughs> love to play this game all freaking day. I know it's fun. Two. Oh my gosh, more existential. <laughs> I'm just gonna keep going down that tunnel. Let's do it. All right. Are we alone in the universe? Absolutely not. <laughs> because I saw that orb. Yeah. I'll tell you the story of this orb. So my, my law professor, he started taking to me after I told him the experience I had where I was like, I don't think life is real. Don't even know how I got in this conversation with him, but he was like, I dig it. You're spiritual. Let's go to these meetings. There were like uh, people at Duke in North Carolina who had experiences that were bizarre. And I was just like sitting there listening to all of them and they were some crazy shit. But ever since that happened, I guess I started opening up this portal to things And we had got home from a meeting one night and I went to bed. Everyone's like, were you sober? Are you sure? And I'm like, are you sober right now? Like I turned over and there was like this warm, like slowly vibrating, buzzing thing. And it was getting like hot on my neck. And I turned and it was just like right in front of me, this big golden thing. And it was crazy. And I was terrified, even though my energy friend that I was talking about, he was like, orbs are one of the most positive forces in the universe. And I was like, I don't care. It's terrifying because it opens you up. Like, what is this? What is real? I don't have any of the answers. So I think that there are a lot of things that I don't know. Mm -hmm. And I'm definitely not brave enough to inquire about them because if I saw that, that positive little golden thing and got scared about that, I'm like, I don't know. It's okay to not know. (laughs) Yeah. I mean, you don't have to. I think too, one of my favorite um, teachers of all time is Ram Dass. And one of the things that he says, and one of the reasons I like him is because I think he holds space for all the magical, mystical weirdness Mm. while also being very practical of like how we live awake. And one of the things that he says is that if you go down that path, like there's some crazy stuff that, cause he studied in India with a lot of teachers that could do that had like cities or magical powers. So they could like levitate and do all this crazy stuff. And he's like, yeah, you can definitely like, if you're going to go there, there's stuff to be found, but that can become the distraction too. Like yeah. that can become, you know, like getting you out of the moment. And so it's, it's helped me almost separate that of like, Cause sometimes in the conscious world, people kind of make that all the same as the more you wake become, the more you're going to be like dancing with the aliens and like <laughs> astral traveling, but it doesn't have to be that way. It's almost like a separate thing. Like you, you can live a very awakened, present, healthy life without dancing with aliens and astrals. <laughs> but if you really aliens, want to, you can <laughs> you probably could. commit a lot of energy. It's like, what am I going to commit my energy into? And because of, like what I believe that we all are at the end of the day, we can make anything with our energy. If we focus it enough, like anything in this reality can happen. It's just like, how do I know how to focus my energy? And then what do I choose to focus it on essentially? But yeah, I think a lot of people do use that as a distraction. Like instead of being in the body in the moment, which is like the most spiritual practice you can have. Yeah. That it is sort of like another like way of obtaining or achieving certain experiences, which they are really cool and interesting and remind you that you don't know shit. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, it's like, I think a lot of people have that experience when they do drugs or something. So like, and you know, I I get it. Drugs are cool. Experiences are cool. But like that's not a substitute for being and that's not a substitute for presence. And you don't take that and become that through your experience. Mm -mm. It's It's not going to get you there. It's a different road. Yeah. I've had people ask me that all the time. Like I had this crazy trip and how come I can't stay in this space? And I'm like, because you're not on drugs anymore, bro. (laughs) Yeah, that's (laughs) not it. And there is a big misconception that like the psychedelic zone is what it's like to be awake and it's not like it's yeah. you can have really profound moments of presence through those experiences for sure but it doesn't if that's going to be your path like eventually you're going to have to figure out a way to get there in your sober day-to-day yeah. life yes. you know and <laughs> it doesn't necessarily point. look like you're just tripping balls all the time it's just it's like it's like the presence <laughs> and the peace that you can get from those things you can find that yeah elsewhere yes so <laughs> love it okay i love this conversation <laughs> I know. it's great three we already did six oh, that's the storyline rock bottom story about rock bottom oh rock bottom (laughs) i'm like i've had so many it's so hard (laughs) to really say the most rock bottom um 
I'd say when my mom died, I went mm. on vacation for six months and I spent a weird amount of money. I'm, I I didn't know what to do. I was so empty. Also, five of my other friends passed away that year. So it was like back to back to back to back. Like it felt like I was in a video game and I was like, am I next? Um, and I just felt so freaking lonely. Like I yeah. felt like I didn't even exist wherever I went. I was trying to be happy by buying things. It's like, I'm going to go to Hawaii and I'm going to be with a handsome guy. I'm going to get a Jeep and we're going to eat this and buy that. And I was just like, fuck, what is, none of this even matters if you can't be with yourself and be at peace. And yeah. I think that I learned a lot from that because so much of my life before that was heavily focused on getting things and receiving things and material things and experiences mm -hmm. um, because I wanted to feel a certain way. And then that really started to shift where I was like looking at myself like, why did I buy this? Where am I? Who cares? I'm still fucking yeah. miserable right now. Yeah. Um, and it was huge. And it really helped me to not detach from the world completely, but to be able to come into my body where now I play in the world of form. I enjoy things, but I don't need them and I don't mm. expect them to make me happy anymore. Yeah. So I That's feel like that was huge. huge. Yeah. Oh, rock bottom. What a blessing is rock bottom. Right? It really is. It's a gift. Like I hope everybody listening gets to rock bottom. Oh my God. I, I wish that upon you all. It's very easy. Just, uh. <laughs> all right. Uh, five. five. We have no five. I can't remember the ones we don't have. <laughs> Just three and Two. five. Two. More existential ones. Okay. How do you know when it's time to let go? <sighs> when it hurts to hold on. Mm. Or just always. I try to make <laughs> just all I try to make it a practice to let go of everything. Like not just this or that, but in my way of being where just being in your mind, I think, is where you hold on to so many things throughout the day. Like you replay conversations or like questions you have or things you have to do. And I really try to be so present where none of it matters unless it's physically in front of my face. So it's sort of like we were saying before, dissolving the mental structures that energetically attach you to things yeah that's good but in terms of like things in your life people ask me all the time how to let go I feel like there's there's two parts of this one everybody's process and path is so different so I'm mm -hmm. never gonna say you have to let that relationship go because I had a relationship like or a non-relationship relationship like that where for years people were like he doesn't give a fuck about you he does not yeah. love you what are you doing and it was through my own process that I healed and evolved and it wasn't just deciding you're right. So there's always that aspect. But I think that in terms of like, you know, how people have a hard time letting go of experiences, I've learned that for me, you don't really let go of experiences. You stop judging and labeling them and then they have less power over you and they sort of let go mm. of you. So yeah. that's kind of the way that I embody my mental emotional state so that things don't really accumulate where I need to let go of them. Yeah. My That's therapist hard. always says, move through, don't let go. Cause I'm kind of, I'm like, I just want to let this go. And she's like, but you got to move through it. <laughs> I'm like, fine. <laughs> yeah. Somebody, somebody said to me one time years ago, everything you ever try to let go of has claw marks all over it. Ugh. And I was like, damn, that's so true though. Oh, wow. Yeah. Letting that, go is supposed to be hits. graceful and light and easy. And everyone's like, I can't let it go. Yeah. Oh my gosh. <laughs> claw marks. Right. I'm going to keep that one. All right, I'm going to say screw the dice and I'm going to read you the rest of these expert <laughs> questions because we're running out of time and okay. I really want you to answer them. <laughs> okay. Rigging the game. <laughs> I know. It's my game. I can rig it. Nice. Okay. What do we do when we notice a pattern in our partner and where is the line between supporting them and trying to change them? Having a conversation in a compassionate way that allows them to, that invites them to see something without trying to get them to see it. Mm. So if my partner is projecting, instead of telling him you're projecting, you're not seeing clearly, I'll say something like, is it possible that there's a different way to see this? Is it possible that there's another perspective? And sometimes he'll say no. Yeah. <laughs> and that's okay. And so I think it's realizing, like we said before, having compassion, having patience, but also if it's something that keeps recurring, that's keeping you guys from connecting and having more flow in your relationship than having a conversation on how you guys can work through it in your own dynamic, not how they can fix it, but also like if I know my partner is sensitive to this subject, instead of just telling him to grow up and be mature and move mm -hmm. through his triggers, being mindful of how I speak and communicate within that and how I can change my energy to support him. Mm. That's great. Oh, I love that. What are the best tools you have for arguments? Ooh, we actually created um, a little diagram that we had on our whiteboard because... 
we struggle with conflict resolution. Mm-hmm. It, it can get like so crazy and loopy to the point where we're like, what are we talking about? So we have different stages. Like in the beginning, if one person is starting to lose consciousness, then we'll like hold each other's hands, breathe together, flow our energy. That almost never fucking happens because yeah. it's like very quick. So <laughs> yeah. we wrote, we've written that tool, excited to try it one day. Um, And then after that, it's sort of like, um, hey, we're starting to get on the ride. We're starting to do that thing again. Like, let's take a minute together. And like, that's when we'll like actually like I'll rub his arm or he'll Mm -hmm. like hug me. And sometimes if that's too intense and we're like really in it and both of us are unconscious, then it gets to the point where it's like, let's take space. Can you agree this conversation isn't serving us right now? Mm. Because then we can come back later and sort of talk about it from a clear headed perspective as opposed to being so reactive and in it where it's not like us trying to figure something out together anymore. It's like me versus you in that place of unconsciousness, which is just not helpful for anybody. Yeah. Nothing good comes out of that place. Yeah. Yeah. That's it's, it's been difficult for me sometimes to know because I tend to be more of the avoidant attachment type. So I want to be like, let's talk about this later, like all the time. (laughs) So I've actually had to learn how to sit with like, uncomfortable conversations and talk through them but it definitely is a little bit of a dance to Mm. know like at what point do we say okay let's talk about this later and like can we talk about this calmly and or even not necessarily calmly like can we be in our emotions but in a way where we're not against each other that seems to be the point where it's like are we against each other and are we like yeah jab defense now oh i love that and it's such a slippery fucking slope though yeah. which is why it, if i leave my body i have no chance and so mm-hmm. my partner will say like you can't always blame being unconscious and i'm like i wish there was some other reason but i can't That's help it just, once yeah once i leave my body and go into my mind i'm like i don't know what i'm gonna say mm-hmm. <laughs> so it's really i think the most important tool is probably not avoiding conflict, but being able to be in your body and create that space in between your thoughts before it happens to recognize in that initial stage mm-hmm. when it's happening. So you can be like, oh, we're not going down this road. Yeah, that's good. Um, how do we deal with our anger and other uncomfortable emotions in our relationship? <sighs> I personally feel like all emotions are neutral Mm -hmm. and so like when I experience something that's supposedly negative like anger or jealousy I want to sit with it and feel it in my body and really work to neutralize it so for me personally instead of trying to shift my thoughts or think it's not there or be happy or be grateful or whatever I like to go into my body and feel it where the sensation is and breathe through it allow it to be there Mm -hmm. and then slowly like let it dissipate which sometimes it takes a long time Sometimes it takes like an hour maybe and I really have to sit there and remember, you know, it is an illusion in my mind, but it's real in my body. Mm -hmm. So I think in a lot of arguments where I've been angry, I've been okay with something, but my body's still holding on to it. So I'm not able to be loving and return to that space after the conversation. So I really had to cultivate that practice of sitting with it and neutralizing it to be able to come back to the center. What about, I've had, I've realized something that we've learned in our relationship is that I have like some triggers and trauma around having so much fear of other people's anger. Mm. So we've really had to work on like making space for the other person to be allowed to be angry in like a healthy way. Do you have any thoughts on like how we can hold space for our partner's anger? Yeah, it's funny. I was talking about this with a client a couple days ago. This is like his sole thing he's been working on and Mm -hmm. I... I had not really thought about it before. It wasn't really a thing for me, but I would say that being able to sit with your own emotions and being the container for your own emotions is the heart and soul of that. Because if you're able to sit there while somebody's screaming or crying or what have you and feel everything that's arising in your body and being that loving space for yourself without Mm -hmm. feeling like you need to fix or judge them or tell them to be happy or to stop, whatever your manifestation is, then you just become that space of allowing it to be. Mm. So it's not so much about the other person's experience that makes you uncomfortable as it is your own inability to sit with. Yeah. Yeah. So I feel like it always comes back to what are you feeling in your body and how can you hold it? So not like, don't hold it back in a resistant way, but hold it in, in the sense that you're kind of like hugging it in the sense. Accepting it. Yeah. Allowing it. Mm -hmm. That's so good. (laughs) This went by so fast. I'm like, was it really an hour? Okay, I have these rapid fire questions for you. Oh, God. I'm nervous. They're easy ones. They're like, they're just silly, like rapid fires. Okay, you ready? (laughs) Texting or phone calls? 
Oh, God. Depends who it's with. I could text a weird amount of people in a weird amount of hours. <laughs> right. Is there life after death? For sure. Guilty pleasure TV show? Oh, God. Well, I work in TV, so anything. I, it's strange. I'm terrified of murder, but like anything with murder, I'd love to watch it. Really? <laughs> Is there a particular show you're watching right now? Mm, How to Get Away with Murder? I'm very behind. Okay. Season five. I, I haven't watched that one. I should watch it. It's good. It. I've heard it's good. It's good. If an alien asked you right now to go to space, but you might not ever come back, would you go? Oh, it depends what food they have. <laughs> that would be your question. Excuse me, sir. <laughs> what food... <laughs> Is there on your planet? Do you have goldfish? They're what if they said river? something that is you have no idea what it is, but they're like, it's better than your food, I promise. All right. You would go. Yeah. All right. Say something cool. Ugh. What? <laughs> Whatever pops into your head. Uh, now is all there is. I didn't make that up and it's not <laughs> that cool, but it's true. There you go. What could you eat for a whole week straight? Goldfish. <laughs> That's so goldfish, yeah. really. I never liked goldfish. It's fucking offensive. <laughs> it's not my favorite snack okay there's a spider in your house do you, oh my god do you no. kill it or set it free oh um i let my boyfriend handle it <laughs> i did try to kill one spider one time and it was so bad i took off all my clothes because it, it <sighs> crawled on me and i started beating it with the pillow like oh, i was murdering no. a human and my boyfriend came in and was like you need to go to a therapist about this <laughs> i was like <gasps> the serious yeah. phobia. yeah oh yeah what's the best milk milk yeah like oat uh, milk soy milk coconut milk. milk coconut milk <laughs> good choice what is love who we are mm. would you want to live forever fuck no i don't <laughs> ever want to come back here <laughs> yeah that's fair uh do you have any nicknames um cal my initials oh yeah uh what's your favorite city in the entire world city yeah well D, none of the above. <laughs> <laughs> really? I don't know. I, I like Kauai. I know that's not a city. It's a whole mm. island. But that counts. All right. Kauai can be one. Yeah. Uh, what would you reincarnate as if you had to a come plant. back since you don't want to? <laughs> a, a plant. plant. Yeah. With any particular plant? <laughs> Just one that doesn't have a brain. <laughs> <laughs> I like it. All right. Well, that's all. Thank, Thank you so you. much for coming. This was so fun was and so such fun. a good conversation. And I learned a lot. I hope everyone listening did too. And yeah good luck with everything do you want to tell anybody about where they can find you and learn more if they want to work with you and yeah um my instagram is journey to the heart but there are little periods in between each of the words if the regular journey to the heart is listening i will buy it from you check your dms <laughs> yes I love that guys. awesome and i'll post all you can check my instagram too and i'll be posting about it and linking to all your stuff so Yay, thank, thank you, you so much <laughs> <laughs>